what you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 184 of Category 5 Technology TV. It is so nice to have you here and uh, good to see you. Tonight we are going to be resuming our uh, very special feature about uh, web development. Uh, so stick around. I've got uh, a lot of stuff going on. Lots of people here in the studio with us. John, good to see you behind the camera. Nice to have you here. <laughs> good to see you, John. He's back. Good to see you. Uh, we also have uh, Krista, who's joining us here. Hello. Hey, Krista. As well as, as you hear over there, Eric with the deep voice. The, the short, fat guy with the pogo plug shirt. I'm here. Here he is. And <laughs> Hillary. Hello, everyone. And how are you tonight? Who, me? Yeah. I'm you? great. I think she's Fantastic. giggly. <laughs> <laughs> What's coming up in the news tonight? Oh, people, you better hang on to your socks here, because coming up in the newsroom... The popular travel advice site, TripAdvisor, has been compromised by super cyber criminal folk. And its users can expect to get an increased amount of spam as their email addresses have been stolen from the service. Hmm. Facebook is cracking down on underage users. And if you're under 18, they want you out. It could mean automatic suspension of your account and loss of all farming and mafia assets. In what some would call ironic hacking, MySQL.com was owned by an SQL injection attack. Details were revealed on Sunday, and I'll be telling you all about it. And lastly, in some cool tech news, a fully transparent TV from Samsung might make a great window, but what to do if the neighborhood kid throws a ball right through it? So you can stick around for these stories, because they're coming up in 30 minutes. Awesome. Thanks, Hill. Nice to see you. Thanks. I'm glad I'm here. Yeah. Hey to our <laughs> chat room as well. We've got lots of people there. Uh, Hillary, are you joining us in the chat room? I believe so. Okay. Well, yes, if not, that's my dropping of a hint. So uh, she'll be joining us there. So uh, if you want to say hi to Hillary, uh, she'll be right there in the chat room, category5.tv. Hey, nice to see D-Man810 uh, as well as Gadwill Office. Uh, we've got uh, JVSCC joining us. Ah, there's Hillary joining us in the chat room as well. Chris Reich and uh, Eric Kidd. Eric, it's nice to see you. Hey. It's been a few weeks. It's nice to be seen. You know, you get to this age, it's, it's good to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, uh, we've, what we've done here is, is uh, we've set up the old studio where, uh, where we used to have the newsroom and uh, just getting everything set up and, uh, and good to go. So I think, uh, generally speaking, we're... we're all right tonight, as far as that goes. Uh, camera's over your right side yeah. here, so uh, that's where she's you at. Know, I'm all showered up and everything, and they put me in a whole separate studio. It I, figures don't, I the, don't know. It figures the one night that he cleans himself <laughs> off. He's, you put you know, him in the not, corner. He's, he's yeah. kind of distant from us. Bad so. Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so nice to see everybody joining us, and we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. Lots to cover. <laughs> I know we've got lots of viewer questions as well. Um, so... We can uh, take it away if you want to uh, hit me up with some viewer questions there, Eric. Sorry, I, I was just, uh, uh, some, somebody uh, pointed out that, that I look pretty too, so. I feel pretty. Oh, sorry. Um, let's go into some questions. That was a question. We have a question here from, uh, well, I'm going to say it could be barbecue with a Y on the end, but uh, we're not <laughs> completely sure. It's uh, a Windows 7 operating system, and... Uh, the question is, Bluetooth on Windows 7. I just had a hard time trying to make my Bluetooth adapter work. I had paired a Bluetooth mouse and my BlackBerry Storm. Suddenly, I think I pushed the pairing mode button on my mouse. The mouse doesn't work. Neither does the BlackBerry. The devices are listed on the control panel, but they just don't connect. There's no remove device option either. Should we keep trusting on Bluetooth devices on Windows 7? Thanks. Ah. Uh, I I don't think there should be a problem with Windows 7 as long as your device is working is is actually compatible with Windows 7. Um, of course, if it's an older device, uh, being that uh, your Windows 7 box is quite possibly 64-bit, uh, maybe there's not a driver installed, maybe there's something going on there. If that's not the case, if it is actually detecting the Bluetooth 
um, the actual dongle that you're using or the, the Bluetooth wireless adapter thing, then what that could be, just to just throw in something out there, is, is just to make sure that, it's n that your devices are not already paired with another device. Uh, you mentioned that you've got both a BlackBerry and the wireless mouse, both Bluetooth. Um, so just make sure that in the off chance that that mouse is not currently paired to your BlackBerry. Because if that was the case, then it may have trouble detecting uh, when, it, when, you try to, uh, when you try to connect that to, uh, to Windows. Just throwing something out there. But as far as uh, trusting Windows 7 to, uh, to work with your, your Bluetooth, I don't see any issues with that as long as your Bluetooth uh, dongle is compatible with Windows 7. Um, that said, they're extremely inexpensive these days. So if you do find that, uh, you know, do some searching, get the uh, get the model number of your of your device itself, and uh, and then determine if uh, if it is going to be compatible. Typically, Windows 7 should pretty much detect any device out of the box, like as soon as you plug it in. Um, but there are the you know there's the off chance that it it might not. So um, if that's the case, then uh, you know get on the get on the web, find out. Uh, if you can find the uh, the driver itself for Windows 7 from the manufacturer of the uh, device, and if not, like I say, they're inexpensive, um, so pass that one along to uh, to a family or friend who uh, who's still using Windows XP or uh, potentially someone who has uh, who has uh, Linux as well, because a lot of those devices will work on Linux uh, even if they won't work on Windows 7. So, uh, and then you can just pick up a cheap one at uh, at your local super center. <laughs> as well, I would make sure that you. Uh, power cycle everything before you do anything radical. Sometimes it just needs a little, uh, you know, kick to actually... Uh, Are you talking about Windows 7? No, <laughs> I'm just talking about the Bluetooth. Um, yeah. I, uh, even, even with my uh, BlackBerry in the car, I uh, sometimes both devices are on and they've paired, but it doesn't seem to work until I just sort of disconnect and connect again. So mm. you could try that before you do anything radical. I wonder if that might even be connected to the... Uh, connected to, um, no pun intended if that might be connected to being paired to another device. So the power cycle kind of un unpairs it during that's that moment. That's a possibility. That's possible too. Possibly a possibility. Thanks for the question. I hope that that helps. Okay. We have another one from Ryan. Hey, Ryan. And uh, I have a dual boot WinXP Ubuntu 10.10 10 machine and have just added an additional hard drive. Both are working fine in Ubuntu 10.10. Uh, I would like to migrate the whole 300 gig drive to the new one terabyte drive. What is the simplest way? Thanks for any suggestions, Ryan. So, sorry, Eric. So there's um, a dual boot environment. Dual wanna... boot, WinXP and Ubuntu 10.10. Okay. And he's added upgraded. a hard drive. Sure. And everything's working fine in Ubuntu, and he wants to. Migrate the whole 300 gig drive to the new one terabyte drive. Okay. Uh, a couple of suggestions in the chat room here. Uh, Tordo is saying uh, to use DD, which is uh, is definitely a good option. That's uh, like a, a sector by sector copy of your drive, uh, but that's from uh, from the <laughs> <laughs> Greg in Texas. Don't, Greg, be nice. Don't necessarily <laughs> type the things into your uh, <laughs> into your. Uh, System, you know, our DD doesn't really stand for disk destroyer. No, it doesn't. Okay. It does not. It, nobody really knows. I what think it's it stands a direct for. dub. I've been told, but it's it's okay. all kinds of things. It's like a it's a sector by sector copy. Um, Tordo also saying rsync is another option. I tend to uh, when I when I do something like that, what I'm going to more lean towards is something like Clonezilla, as Agamotto is suggesting, um, something where I'm able to simply image from. Uh, one device to another. Uh, Agamotto suggesting that DD could stand for disk duplicator. Makes sense, but then it also does much more than that. So um, we can use DD for example. Well, we're not going to get into DD, but um, so I would I would say Clonezilla. Uh, look at the Clonezilla tutorial that I did a little while ago, and just consider that instead of sending that that uh, that image to a network share like I did in the demonstration. Clonezilla will allow you to instead image directly to another hard drive. So that can be that one terabyte hard drive. It can be much bigger. Now keep in mind that, uh, that Windows, um, as well as possibly Ubuntu, are going to see, uh, it's quite possible that it's going to recreate the uh, partitions the way that they were on the original drive. So you're not immediately going to be able to, 
um, utilize the entire amount of space. Let's say it was a 500 gig drive and you image it to a one terabyte drive, it's still, when you boot it up, you're going to say, well, where's my extra space? Because what it is is it's unallocated space on that hard drive. And because you've already done partitioning, uh, you understand what that means, is that there is space for yet another partition. So of course you could do that, or you could use a tool, um, uh, let's just say, there, there are some boot CDs. Uh, I would say like gpart-ed boot CD, for example. Uh, and then you can, you can stretch that partition and make it, uh, make it larger. I'm going to have some links for you uh, in the show notes for episode number 184. Uh, but essentially, we're looking at Clonezilla uh, to do the clone itself. And then uh, I would say, you know, we're keeping everything open source and free. Uh, you don't have to buy any of the software. It's, it's absolutely free for you. And then using um, the um, gpart-ed boot CD uh, in order to resize the partitions at that point. So I hope that, uh, that helps point in the right direction. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and you'll find us online, www.category5.tv. It's a full house tonight, it feels like. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's good to see you. Oh, well, it's always good to see you. How's your week going? Um, busy so far, but busy good. She says that good. on the air. I, noticed, I just noticed that she says that on the air before. She was, like, nitpicking at me and throwing <laughs> things at me and stuff. Oh, it's I have good to, to get see it you. out sure. before the show. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it looks like uh, we've got lots lots to come, so we can just, uh, we have some more questions there. Right? We have okay. some more questions. Okay. Here's I, I'm not to, not to push, so, but we've got a big feature tonight, and, and uh, so we do want to try to get your questions in if we can. So we'll just get through this, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is from uh, Draskus, I guess. Hey, Draskus. Robbie, in episode 182, you said that people should not connect to unencrypted Wi-Fi to check their email. However, if you are using webmail that uses HTTPS or you use SSL from a mail program, you should be okay, right? I was under the impression that you are encrypting your traffic starting with your computer and so it should be encrypted even over the Wi-Fi. Thanks, Draskus. Yeah, in that kind of case, Draskus, it, you're probably um, you're, you're more safe than you would be um, if you were using a non-HTTPS server. Understand that the traffic between your computer and the wireless router is unencrypted in a case where um, it's an open network. So that can be dangerous. If you're connected to a, a, an encrypted website, I think I used the example of the, the online banking, that's an encrypted website. And so the data transmission from your browser to that website is going to be 128 or 256 bit a AES encryption. But that said, because you're on an open network, there's the potential. Now it's rare, or like it's 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 not as likely, okay? But it's it's possible that there could be a keylogger or something on your computer that's able to then grab your your keystrokes and transmit them to uh, to a nearby packet sniffer or something. Um, if you use wireless, uh, like just to just to give you an example of what can be done as far as what hackers can do, um, a wireless keyboard. Um, can be the, the keystrokes can be intercepted from the wireless keyboard. So if you're sitting at your computer with a wireless keyboard and you're typing away and you put in your, your password for online banking, sure, the computer transmits in an encrypted state to the online banking site. However, what, w there's no encryption between other devices. So, um, so there is a possibility that you know somebody has potentially through a Trojan thrown something on your computer if it's a Windows system. Uh, there's a definite threat there uh, that you know you could have something that's monitoring what you type. Um, so getting onto an open network can open you up to all kinds of vulnerabilities. But that said, if you're on an open network with no encryption there, and you're connecting to an encrypted website, you're most most likely safe. Um, but it's the fact that you know we get so accustomed. You also want to be careful because we get so accustomed to being on our home network and being on a secure network that you almost take for <coughs> granted. And do we always check, you know, that this security certificate is valid? Not too likely. Do we always check that the, that the lock is uh, in place when we go to a, a secure website? Um, so just some thoughts to ponder. But I think you're right that essentially you're, you're better protected in that case. Um, but it's still not good practice to connect to open Wi-Fi at all, um, in my opinion. I'll just tag that on the end. <laughs> Thanks for the question. In Robbie's opinion, 
<laughs> I can just see you getting a t-shirt made. Results may vary. <laughs> Mileage may vary. <laughs> Thanks Sorry. for that. It's like the weight loss sites. Results not typical. Okay. Um, we have another question. What does that question. tell you? A nice disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> I lost and in severe cases, in may week. cause yeah. death. Yeah. Quite possibly, okay. actually. Um, this is from Gadwell. Hey, hey Gadwell. Gadwell. Um, operating system. Well, we have a plethora. Myriad operating systems here. Win 7, Ubuntu 10.04, Arch, OpenSUSE, etc. Okay. Um, good evening. First, my request. Could you please show us how to make a virtual machine in virtual box and copy the files needed, such as the VDI, and install it to be used on another OS? I just made an XP Pro machine in Win 7 and want to move it into my Ubuntu without reinstalling everything. This would be a big help if possible. Sure. Second. Okay, well, let's start with that. If you want to keep your place. <laughs> Because it Just sounds a like it's a I'm holding my finger on the monitor here. It sounds like it's a multiple, multiple <laughs> yes. question here. And typically, when you send us a, uh, an email live at category 5tv best practice is to break up your questions into multiple email if there's going to be multiple questions. The reason I say that, sometimes we run short on time. So if we read the first question and we get that answered for you, we might have to move on before we get to the second question, in which case we may never get to the second question because it might fall through the cracks next week when we're sorting our email and we say, oh, well, we already answered that one uh, because it's the first one. So, so keep in mind, you're best to uh, send us multiple emails. So based on your question there about, uh, about the virtual machines, once you've created your virtual machine in VirtualBox, of course, as you know, it creates the VDI file. You've got a, a virtual hard drive. So I've got a couple of, uh, a couple of different machines here. So in order to get those on your Ubuntu system, if that's what you're running, um, you're going to go into your home folder, and within your home folder, you're going to actually go to dot slash, uh, or pardon me, slash dot. So we're going like that, and then virtual box with a capital V. As soon as you start typing it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do it, but virtual box with a capital V, capital B, with a period before it because it's a hidden folder. Once you're in there, you're going to see a couple of folders, hard disks and machines. You can back up everything if you want. Easiest thing to do is just go into your hard disks and you'll see that here are the actual virtual hard drives of each of those virtual machines. This file, for example, is a 2.2 gigabyte file, so I could easily enough burn that onto a C uh, DVD, or I could also transfer that via, via a flash card, a USB flash stick or something, or through my network. Um, so then, from there, you get over to your, uh, to your other system. Uh, and keep in mind, if you, if you created the virtual machine on a Windows system, file location will be different, but still, you can just grab that file uh, from, your, from your users folder on Windows. So um, then take that, move it over to another computer. Now you've just got the hard drive, you don't have the actual machine. You've got to create the, the virtual hardware again. So next step is to, on the new, new computer, the new host computer, you're going to add a new virtual machine, just as if you were creating a new one. But this time, you want to actually select an existing hard drive. So for example, if I'm in VirtualBox, it doesn't matter what my host platform is, here I am, okay, and I go new virtual machine, next, name of the virtual machine, test. How much RAM do I want to give it? Fine, and here's the question. You want to create a new hard disk, or would you like to use an existing hard disk? So what you want to do is you want to first copy that hard, hard disk, the virtual hard disk, over to your computer or onto your network somewhere where it's accessible um, and it, because you, you can't run that disk from the DVD or from your USB flash drive because answered everything. <laughs> I wasn't trying to encourage him folks, it just sure. happened. Moving right along then. <laughs> shall we Welcome to Windows, yeah. Shall we go to this neat tip? Carry or on. do you want to <laughs> yeah. show ahead. everybody your blue screen? No, that's fine. Okay. Second, a neat tip to share. This tip is to show everyone how to track exactly how many resources an application is using on Windows in a given amount of time. It is built in every system that I have tried and works flawlessly. For steps, check the top answer on this article. Uh oh, here we go. HTTP colon slash slash stackoverflow.com okay, let me, slash. Let me grab it. You want to grab that? I can bring up the email. Slash question slash sure. six nine three 
three two yeah. slash tracking he, dash he does this cpu <laughs> folks and this well is... okay you guys could talk amongst yourself while he tries to find the email i've got the email. or i could continue oh, going i've got it right here <laughs> okay don't make me come over there oh <laughs> okay what i'm going to do is i'm going to throw this through our url shortener what is what is this pertaining to because i got to give it a name this is oh. uh how does much uh, what the resources are that an application is using. So Okay. So Resource I'm tracker. This, I'm going to call this mem usage. Okay. How's that? So cat5.cp. But it's CV. CPU and mem. That's done. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Shall right. I finish with the rest of the comment here? I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to grab this URL, though, and I'm going to bring it up on the screen uh, while you're reading. so You go ahead. Okay, you go ahead. It would also be neat if you could show us how to do something comparable in Linux. Well, oh, this is part two of the question now. All right. This wasn't, well, that was sort of a question, I guess, but it's, it's more of a comment. It would be neat if you could do it. It wasn't really okay. a, would you do it? All right, well, let's see what it is. Thanks does. to Robbie for reading slash answering and to everyone else involved with the Eric's show. Eric's doing all the reading, Gavin. Uh That would be, you know, Hillary, John, <laughs> Krista, Becca. Who else do we have involved here tonight? There's the... <laughs> The whole uh, Cat5 family out there. Yeah. Cat5.tv slash mem usage takes you there. And let's see here. Okay. So, talking about running. Uh, let's see. Performance window open. Oh, uh, Perfmon. The performance monitor in, uh, in Microsoft Windows. Um, so I don't have a Windows machine to, to show you Perfmon. Um, it's an it's a nice tool if you've got Windows. Uh, try that. Run uh, P E R F M O N uh, from uh, your Run dialog or just from wherever. It's a GUI, so you don't have to be in uh, the command prompt or anything like that. Is that different from uh, performance in Task Manager? Uh, yeah, uh, Task Manager gives you kind of an overview of like uh, memory okay. usage processes okay. that are running uh, and the graph. Perfmon is more of an ongoing um, kind of overview of the CPU state, things like that. Um, so a little bit different in, in what it's presenting and allows you to, to kind of zoom in on some of that data. Uh, I would say uh, probably GK Realm would be the one that I would look at as far as Linux goes. Uh, I'll bring up my terminal just to, let's install it with apt, just to be all fancy-like. Here we go. sudo apt get install gk rel with two m's m i think is how we spell it enter your password and let's see if this is what you're looking for oh it's just going to install no prompts or anything i guess once it's in there hit alt f2 that is the linux command for run application and type gk rel um and that gives you this tool over here that you see and that is very similar data. You can see that it breaks it down into uh, into your cores, gives you your your proc information, your your disk activity, which is pretty helpful. Um, because sometimes you know what you, you look at your computer and you wonder why it's slow, and sometimes you wonder, well, my CPU is only at forty percent. What's going on? But you don't realize that your hard drive actually slows down your computer so, like just exponentially if it's uh, if if it's being maxed out and and starting to have some trouble or anything like that. So, um, so I would give that a go, uh, Gadwell. Is that, the, uh, is that the end of the email? That was the end of that email. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. no, actually the end was, you know, thanks to Robbie for reading and answering and, okay. and to everyone. I mean, you read the end yeah. of the email. All right. Yeah, okay. That was the recap. Thanks, Gadwell, <laughs> uh, and uh, certainly don't mind taking the time with, uh, with Gadwell. He's a, a very active uh, member of our, our forum at Category5.tv. And uh, we certainly uh, appreciate having him as a part of our, our show. Thanks. All right. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and you'll find us online, www.category5.tv. If you're watching this live, hey, cool, I got an email. That's what that sound means. Very cool. <laughs> made me turn I, my, you made me turn my BlackBerry <laughs> off. And no. well, it's, <laughs> I actually got an email last week, somebody watching the show live, just to say, I just heard you get an email. <laughs> wow. So you can imagine what happened. That's I got good. two emails on the show. 
just for the fact that somebody <laughs> wanted to mention that they heard the iPod sound. Krista, we're surrounded by geeks. I see Sur that. <laughs> surrounded. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> So if you're, if you're not watching this live, you're watching this after the fact, be it on Miro Internet TV, iTunes, uh, if you're watching this on Roku Box through the Blip.TV app, uh, if you're watching this on your iPhone or your Android device, wherever you're watching us, get on over to our website, Category5.TV. That would be a, a great place. Uh, it's, a, it's an exceptional resource as far as the show goes. Uh, if you do enjoy the show, then I think you're really going to like our website and, and find that there's a lot of cool stuff there. Uh, but in addition to that, it's a great community. I love uh, the fact that we have a very active community and we love to have you involved. One of the cool new features that we have for the mobile device is uh, a QR codes, which Eric, you're familiar with QR codes, eh? And you probably use them on your Blackberry. Sure. This is something that's pretty cool. And I'll just, uh, if you want to, if you've got a, a mobile device with a QR code reader and, you, and you're not, uh, and you've never seen this on our website, you can bring up category5.tv and you see this app here John this is it looks like a like a video camera there's really nothing to it other than the fact that it has a little grid in the middle and it says that it's going to see that little square so this is it's a QR code reader is what it is so there there are a ton of apps like this it's kind of trippy doing it that way <laughs> and this one is simply called QR code reader and it's available for free in the app store for the iPhone and iPod touch uh, as well as the iPad if you have the camera in your in your device what you can do is you can bring up our website category5.tv and this is kind of interesting you see the episodes here and let's say last week's episode website development part three if I bring up the show notes for that episode you see that there is a QR code and that's what this uh, grid thing is and if you're watching the show right now you could actually scan the screen with your phone and you'll see that that will actually uh, bring something up for you so all I have to do is I need to take this and I'm just gonna point it to the screen and almost instantly what's going to happen like I don't have to click or anything and it actually brings up the mobile version of the uh, the website I don't know if you can get in there John to see but what's interesting about it is if you look at here the the episode that we're looking at again is uh, episode num number uh, 183 and so by pointing to the uh, to the screen with my QR code reader we've actually got that exact same episode but we have it in mobile version so now we're able to just simply play that directly on our iPhone or our portable device and it just loads it right up into QuickTime on the iPhone uh, iPod Touch or the uh, or the iPad and that will actually start streaming the show directly from our servers now if you don't actually have that particular app you were mentioning yep. um, you know even in uh on a BlackBerry, if you go into the BlackBerry Messenger, there's you mm -hmm. know scan a group barcode. You oh, can yeah, use okay. that little uh, yeah. little guy there. And uh, cool. And uh, I'm just going to make sure that actually works before I tell everybody to go and try that. <laughs> it should work with uh, with any device that has a QR code reader, uh, and they're always available for free. If someone wants to charge you for a QR code reader, um, note that you'll probably find one for free that will do everything that you need it to do. So I hear that. Uh, well, it it's in. Yeah. Um, this is on a BlackBerry Torch? Yeah. Of course, I'm not seeing anything, but, uh, well, we'll leave that alone. You don't have your glasses on. That's the problem. All right. Okay. <laughs> do we have time for another question? We do not. It is time. We don't. No. I can't work under these conditions. Well, if you uh, sent in the question and we didn't get to you tonight, uh, just note that we will do our best to cue you for next week. Uh, and, of course, you can email your questions live at category5.tv or directly off of our website. Click on Interact at category5.tv. Hillary, it is time. Hooray. That's my little cue. Yeah, here we go. Oh. Uh, okay, from Category 5. <laughs> We're both unprepared. There we go. You're ready. Uh, from Category5.tv newsroom. If you use TripAdvisor, you may soon be getting more spam. The travel site told customers in an email Thursday that someone has breached its network and stolen email addresses for an undisclosed number of its members. Steve Coffer, co-founder and chief executive for TripAdvisor, wrote in the email, We've confirmed the source of the vulnerability and have shut it down. We're taking this incident very seriously and are actively pursuing the matter with law enforcement. Did you know that the minimum age of a person um, that uses Facebook is 18? 
Yet, studies show that around 50% of 12-year-olds in the U.S. alone are active users of the social networking site, and those numbers increase with the 13 to 17-year-olds. According to a CNN report, Facebook has begun enforcing the age restriction and has been actively booting as many as 20,000 under 18-year-old users per day. Facebook is also actively working to improve their ability to detect when someone fakes their age in order to gain access. If your child uses Facebook, it's not a case anymore of whether you want them to or not. If they're under 18, they're forbidden to use the service, and Facebook is doing what they can to block them. Hillary, I was just kind of curious about that because you're saying that uh, they're blocking 20,000 under 18 users a day. I just was wondering if they just go through Justin Bieber's fan list and just kind of start ticking people off. Okay, good place to 20,000 is kind of the limit as far as how much they can do in a day. Manpower. I feel like that would probably be the best way to detect that for sure. It would work. Justin Bieber or any of those Disney stars. I mean, yeah, easy, done, get the boot. But uh, yeah, crazy. I have to tell my kid brother that he's going to get the boot soon. Um, in an email that was sent out, though, um, on their full disclosure mailing list Sunday, it was revealed that a number of websites, including mysql.com and sun.com, were compromised using, perhaps ironically, an SQL injection attack. In the blind attack, databases were stolen, which contained both member and employee email addresses and account credentials as well as tables with customer and partner information and internal network details. Encrypted passwords from the database were posted online, with some having been already cracked. MySQL is a databasing platform used by millions of websites for small and medium-sized databases, including uh, by the popular blogging software WordPress. While there have been no word yet if the attack affects other MySQL users or if this was due to a flaw in some other code, but we can expect to hear more from the MySQL team soon with patches released if needed. And lastly, Samsung has developed a completely transparent, yeah, transparent, crazy, solar powered monitor which is designed to be illuminated and powered by ambient light. Although they're marketing the device as a television, it's almost certain that they are going to be used as displays in commercial areas. And since it also has a touchscreen capability, this could lead to some of the coolest kiosks ever conceived. How would you feel if the neighborhood kid, though, put a baseball baseball through that baseball bat? Hello, not good, not good. Uh, You can get these full stories at category5.tv slash newsroom. The Category 5.TV newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Wisdom Guru and our awesome community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. For the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Hillary, thanks so much. That looks like a really cool device. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, could you imagine? <laughs> I've always kind of been intrigued by those, like the the thought of a transparent monitor being able to move things around, especially these days with multi-touch, it would just be astounding. But it's all about backlight, so putting it as a window kind of makes sense on a sunny day. Mm-hmm. What do you do when the sun goes down? And I just can't work past five or six I guess in the winter, so. I guess. Yeah. Unless you're, yeah. you know, what if, what if you're in one of the areas of the world that are like dark for like months? Like up north. Yeah. yeah. You'd be, you'd be really, I guess it's, there's no market up there for Samsung's new televisions. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> the kids stand outside in the cold with a flashlight as dad watches a movie. <laughs> oh, it works, it works. Yeah. This is Category 5 TV, and this uh, this episode of the show is brought to you in part by Pogo Plug, cat5.tv slash Pogo Plug to check them out. And of course, also by uh, Planet Calypso, cat5.tv slash Calypso. Nice to have you here. Eric is uh, is is getting antsy over there. He's like, I'm I can't, sporting I can't see my, you. sporting my poker plug shirt. Yeah. You yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and I I noticed that like the, with the studio setup, you can't really see, but but Eric doesn't have any line of sight to us, uh, but we can see his hair, um, <laughs> and it, it makes me incredibly jealous. But anyways. <laughs> Bet you wish you could have some. <laughs> so, he's looking, so he's looking at us when when you think that he's looking away. He's I was wondering what that us. glow was. Oh, oh sorry. No. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, all he sees is just this dome. <laughs> <laughs> it's from about here up. What was that, uh, Dan Aykroyd, <laughs> Conehead? No, sorry. <laughs> kind of, sort of. Sorry, sort okay. Of. Well, I'll try to behave in the future. 
as we've heard said, moving right along. <laughs> it, then. Could, it could happen. <laughs> Tonight we're going to be uh, looking further at uh, coding our new website that uh, Krista and I have been developing over the past uh, few weeks. And been uh, really having a lot of fun with that, and I think we're learning a lot as well. Um, so I'll just remind you that you can get over to cat5.tv slash webdev, short for web development. And by going there, uh, it's actually going to bring up a special site. I'm going to bring it up for you right now. Web dev. And there we are. And this actually has a list of all the episodes that pertain to this series. And it, in fact, has some downloads as well. You'll notice also that there are now progress archives starting this week. Um, so you can actually download an archive which contains the entire file structure um, as created on each episode so that you're able to follow along even if you're watching this after the fact. So if you're watching this down the road, uh, just note that you can use those archives in order to actually see where we got to at the time if you're unable to, uh, to see it uh, live on the air. Uh, so we're going to continually add those and the episode numbers uh, of the files correspond to the episode in which we created those files. So we're going to go back to our, uh, our source code that we've been working on. One of the things that I, you know that I like to do is I like to keep my files organized. I like to keep things really clean and I like to be able to find things anytime I need them. Right now I've got this comp.psd sitting on my desktop. I'm going to cut that and Eric, Eric knows what it is that I'll, I'll, I'm going to do here. I'm going to create a folder called to put our master files in. Oh, raw. We're going to create a folder called raw. This is just my own preference. I do it all caps so that when I'm uploading to FTP I can see that that is my raw folder. The reason that I do that is so that within the folder of this website I now have all my master files. So these are the files so that if I ever need to go back over things I have that ability. So now I've got that. By keeping things consistent, by keeping naming algorithms consistent, we're able to always find things, regardless of how many websites we're developing. Somebody such as myself or Krista, uh, we, we create websites on an ongoing basis. So uh, I've probably got several thousand websites under my belt. So if it weren't for uh, consistency in my naming structure and consistency in the way that I program, it would get really tough had I a need to go back over um, some code that I created a year earlier. So two things that we can do is one, we keep a, a, a very organized file folder structure uh, and two, maybe three things. Uh, two, the second thing is we keep uh, uh, consistent naming. Um, so I use uh, style.css as my style sheets. You can use whatever you like, but that seems to be, you know, that's what I use and that's consistent uh, across all my websites. And then also, um, I forget the third one. I was going to say the third one. Well, it was two things. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> very important. It very, the, the third one was really pointless, <laughs> I, I tell you. So there we go. We've got our organized folder structure. We're good to go. We're never going to upload the raw folder. This is just for our own reference. And of course, we want to keep it on a backup as well so that if we ever need it, uh, we can go back over it. Let's open back up our files uh, back into gedit or uh, if you're using a different editor. Um, that's fine too. Eric, do you remember the Windows uh, editor that we ha have used in the past? There was like a, a nice, like a notepad replacement. It was almost like WordPad, but it was. Uh, um, PS. It, what for? Uh, yeah, it was something PHP? like that. It was yeah, PS yeah. Pad. I PS believe. Pad. Thank I you, my was, friend. Because yeah. as I'm doing this, I realized that I had promised that I was going to look that up, and I don't think I brought up Windows once this week. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have anything to remind me. Let's do a quick Google search to find PS Pad. There we go. That's fantastic. So if you're on Windows and you want to follow yes. along with this, this is the one. I, I think it was a, a fantastic. Actually, I, I use thing. it quite regularly. Yeah, and you're, on, uh, you're on Windows. Yeah, and yeah. sorry, sorry, kids, I'm still using Windows. Um, you can uh, adjust some of the uh, preferences so that it, uh, you know, uh, certain things that it. It'll, it'll add, uh, you know, closing tags to yeah, HTML, beautiful. which sometimes is annoying when you're... Can be. Can, well, when you, I think when be. you get to the point where you are coding the code. Yeah, you don't actually You don't want, want it to be closing tags because you're doing it. And so, you, yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> so looking at PS Pad, thank you, Eric. PSPad.com, just like it sounds. So this is uh, what it I would recommend. It has its own little FTP... Uh, Oh, yeah. application built in. But this is uh, not open source, but it is freeware. So you can download it absolutely free. 
The latest build published in the forum. That sounds fine. <laughs> so that's where I'm looking. <laughs> Download links. There you go. So I, I believe this is strictly Windows. But if you're on Windows and you want to follow along with us, that's the one you want to use. And you're using Dreamweaver. I am. Is there a free version that you can, like something that you can use for um, free on Mac? That you I know? believe there's one called Komodo Edit. Okay. I yeah. think. Um, like Dreamweaver, just a lot more simplified. Okay. So it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Great. Um, and do we have your Mac up on our, yeah, we do, don't we? We have the ability to bring that up on our screen tonight. That's good. Um, so we'll be able to follow along. So PSPad.com, if you would like to follow along with... Uh, with us on Windows. I'm using gedit on Linux, and we've got Dreamweaver up on the Mac as well. Mm. Good coffee tonight, eh? He's nodding. It's empty yeah. almost. It's, mine's empty. I just finished off my Ubuntu. How's your Hershey's? There we go. I may go for a coffee run, Rob. <laughs> okay, so where we left off last week, we didn't get too far, but we got our... You remember that we had our, our demo site set up. Demo.cat5.tv, and if we go there now, go into the 001 folder, and you'll see that we have this red frame here. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to look at our original mockup and determine, you know, where do we go next? So our mockup is a PSD. I'm going to just open that up in the GIMP. There we go. So it really is a red background, but the lower part, the area that is going to have the actual text of our website is going to be white. You can see that that's the, the far background uh, color. But up here is going to be red. So what we need to do... What? No, I can't see it. You can't see? Oh, well, you've got to tell me these things. I, I buy you a whiteboard. And, you know, you can. I can't see. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So... Up here we see that the logo is, is going to be on the red, but then below that is going to be basically, it's like a, it's a square. It's a rectangle, right? So this makes things easy. That's going to be one div. Um, so what we want to look at is how our logo is going to be positioned. So jumping over to our folder here, which you can download directly from cat5.tv slash webdev. And within this folder, I'm going to take a look at my images and grab the Aspire Place logo. In Linux, if I double click on that, I'm going to see down at the bottom there are the dimensions of the image. Uh, in Windows, you're going to need to possibly right click on it and go properties, uh, which in Linux you can also do. But it's a little couple extra clicks. So 162 by 58 are the dimensions of this image. So in order to add it, we want to, we want to know that. Let's just slap it inside of our wrapper here. So to add an image, we're going to go IMG SRC which is image source equals, we're in HTML, so I'm going to put opening and closing tags for the image, and I'm going to go images, this is relative to our current file location, this is index.php, so we're going into the images folder, slash, and then the name of that file was aspireplacelogo.ping, with underscores uh, in place of spaces. In Linux, I can, oh, oh well, anywhere, you can rename and just highlight it and copy the uh, renamed text. So now I've got it in my clipboard as I zoom in here and paste. Now I have that. Okay, so the image is there. Now we need to specify the width equals, and what did we say it was? 162. Width equals 162. This is not CSS, so we're not adding dot the PX. This is HTML. And then uh, height equals 50, 58. <laughs> Zoom sometimes messes me up. Throw a slash in there to uh, end the element, XML compliance. So quick question. Yeah. Why would you not uh, put your width and height in CSS opposed to, or with CSS opposed yeah. to just in your HTML? You can do that for sure. Um, width and height on an image is something that can be either or. Positioning elements tend to, like if I'm working with a table, you're going to want to set it up in, in the CSS more than the, uh, than the HTML because HTML doesn't give you as much control over the style. With this, it's an either or because it does exactly the same thing. So it's just preference, yeah. essentially. Okay. Or just speed of getting it in there. We don't need to create a class for this, okay. for example. 
if I wanted to specify this in CSS, this image would now have to have an ID um, because we'd have to, like we could call it ID equals logo. And then the logo ID in CSS could have those, those right. dimensions, which we okay. may end up doing anyways, but we kind of thinking linearly, um, we'll, we'll do this kind of step by step and then we may change it down the road. So. All right, so let's take a look. So that has placed that at the top of my wrapper at the left-hand side because wrapper doesn't have any alignment uh, in the uh, in in the uh, actual like text alignment in there. So I'm going to connect to my FTP. I'm going to upload that to my file. This is, uh, <laughs> Hillary's on the screen, and she <laughs> <laughs> the look. <laughs> ah, that was Hillary, by the way. <laughs> Are you surfing YouTube down there? Like <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right, all right. I'm going to mute your mic. Here we go. <laughs> I'm going to create a new folder. We're going to call this one 002. Oh, you are just absolutely ashamed. She's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've created a folder called 002. So if you're in 001, you can, uh, you can get out of that and go to 002. That's on the demo.cat5.tv site, and I'm uploading these changes, including my uh, revised index file. So, back here, again, changing to 002. And you'll see that the logo is slapped right in there. So, now I think we're ready to get rid of that red border. We don't really need that at this point. So, in our CSS, for our wrapper, we're done with that border. We can delete that. Let's have FTP up somewhere else. There we are. Okay, so I'm going to upload my style.css file because I just changed it. There we are. So now if I F5, that red border is gone and we're good to go. So looking at the mock up that you created, Krista, I think there was a little bit of padding at the top up of at that. At the top, yeah. yeah. So it kind of starts where the, the darker red ends. Yeah. So this should be moved down to like, you know, to about there kind of thing. Right. So what we can do, two ways we can do this. You can, you can play the guessing game and just kind of guess at it. Or use your marquee, might as well, and just figure out, you know, how, how tall is that? I'm going to copy that to my clipboard and go edit, paste as new image. Now I've got that that size and I see that it's 24 pixels high. So I know that I need to pad the top or mar uh, add a margin at the top of that image for 24 pixels. So here's where, as I was kind of hinting, we, we may have to create an ID anyways on the logo. <laughs> That's fine, because here we go. So we'll, uh, we'll do that. Let's get rid of that width and height. And we're going to go ID equals logo. Okay. So now it looks like that. Just kind of learning as we go so that we know what all this stuff does. Now it's an ID, so I put a pound sign in there. Logo. Okay. If it was a class, and we're going to learn what, what all that means, but if it was a class equals logo, it would look like that. Because it's an ID, we've got a pound sign there. I'm going to paste in width equals 162 and change it to CSS so it looks like this. And height equals 58 is going to look like this, just like that. And now what we want to do is margin top, what do we say, 24 pixels, so let's say 25 pixels at the top. So I added one pixel because I like to round things to a nice even number, don't I? <laughs> so I'm going to upload again that style.css file, and you notice that we're making changes to the site, but it's just a little bit of text in a style sheet. So I'm just going to drag that over to my FTP server, go back to my site, and refresh. And as I refresh, watch that logo. Uh, let's see. Didn't do anything. That happens. Oh. <laughs> well, see, and this is one of the things that you learn as, you, as you're working on a website. Sometimes you're just back and forth, back and forth. What I did there is I created an ID of logo for the logo. Yeah. I, I uploaded the style sheet, but I didn't upload the index.php. Uh, 
So what I'm looking at is still not, it doesn't have a specified ID. So I have to upload that file as well. I missed one file there. Hit F5, and there we go. So now it is pretty much flush with that line there. We can move it down, we can move it around just by using those margins. Um, if we want to move it down just a little wee bit. Oh. Throw a couple of pixels on there kind of thing. And now you notice, now I only have to upload the style.css. There we go. So it's just got a few more pixels there, so it's not quite touching the line. There we go. So now next up, we need to create uh, an ability to, to add a menu. So this is where things get a little bit tricky because we're working now not top to bottom, we're working left to right. Um, so something that we may want to do, for example, is we might take that logo um, and let's put a div next to it. And we're going to call this ID equals menu. And again, we're going to always close that div um, when we open it. And I do that right up front so that I don't have to remember because it's already done. And I don't have to look and figure, oh, did I close that div? I do it right away and then it's done. Uh, and then we don't have any elements that are breaking our website. So with that, I'm going to add a space, which is NBSP semicolon and NBSP semicolon. So it's not going to output any text, but it's just going to give me an HTML space. And I'm going to create a new ID in my style.css file. And we were going to call this uh, menu border solid one pix white. Okay. So what I've done there is I've created a div. I again need to upload both my style sheet and my index. You're going to see what's going to happen here. Again, we're thinking left to right, but we haven't specified that yet. So the white box is now going to appear directly below our logo. Divs by default are going to take up the entire width of the uh, the element that is wrapping it. In this case, it's the wrapper. That's why it's only going that far. It can only go that far. If you didn't have that wrapper, it would extend all the way to the edge of your browser because the body is the uh, whatever whatever it's uh, surrounding that element. So, what we want to do now is we want to make it so that that is to the right hand side of our logo. So what we can do, we can take the width of our site, 950 uh, pixels, that's a wrapper, right? And then we know that our logo is 162, so automatically we know, you know, what we need to do here. Or what we can do we use a float element, okay? So this is kind of like aligning that element. Let's see what happens. And a lot of times there's a little bit of experimentation that goes in. Again, the, we haven't specified a width yet for this div that's going to be our menu. And therefore, um, it's not going to, uh, it, it's going to be like that. <laughs> Don't know the technical term for like that. So what we can do now is we can float it right. Okay, Floating is exactly what you would expect it to be. And now we're going to specify a width. What could happen is, let's say we go 500 pixels, okay? We're going to upload our style sheet again. And you see what happened there is it's moved the box, five, it's 500 pixels wide and it's just over on the right hand side of the logo and the logo is not forcing it to go to the next line because it's float left, okay? So now we can extend that you know, another 200, 250 pixels. So let's try, let's try 750 pixels and see how that extends. There we go. So that looks about uh, where we would want it based on our mock-up. Okay. So now again, we need to make sure that it's in the right position from the top. So we already learned that margins are what's going to move an element down. Padding, on the other hand, is going to pad the inner uh, side of the div. So if I added padding, it's going to be on the inside of the div as opposed to a margin which is on the outside of the div. So here what we're going to do is we're going to add a margin there that's going to take us down so that it's basically flush with um, 
the, the spot that is supposed to be just under the logo on the right-hand side. So margin top. And uh, the height of the logo is 58. So we'll say, um, in this case, let's say, oh, there's padding of 28. So let's start with, remember, this is the top edge of that div. So let's start with 75 pixels just to see where that puts it. Because remember, this is the top of the div. There we go. So that's a little bit too low. See? So then again, we just kind of move it up a little bit. And you see why I, why I tend to put a border on something, because it really helps you to position something on the screen. Mm -hmm. Because with web, you don't have that chance to drag and drop for real. Like, because Weissawig is, is only really goes so far. When you're tr really, truly programming something, um, it helps to have that, to be able to see where, where it is that this is going to actually fall on your screen. Um, so here we go. Let's bring that margin top down to 65 and see what that does. <laughs> there we go. So that's looking pretty good. So now this element, as you know, the, the white square is going to be our menu. That's exactly where our menu is going to fall. Uh, and now we have a place to place that. So all we need to start doing now, because we have that element, now what I can do is I can remove that white border, right? because we know it's in the right position and it's where we want it. I can save that and I can go up to my index and now within this div I can get rid of that NBSP and I can start going home, about us, etc. Right? And now, if I upload those two files, and bring up our website and refresh. I have a spot that my menu is uh, going to be at. I'm just going to mute your microphone there. There we go. All right. So that uh, that is going to get us into next week where we're going to start uh, we're going to kind of finalize the way that our menu is going to function. We're going to set up how uh, our body wrapper uh, is going to uh, maintain the actual uh, content of the site. And we're going to get kind of work our way down on that website and get it so that uh, it's looking just like the mock-up. And very soon we're going to be able to start populating it with, uh, with content and breaking it out into individual uh, pages so that you can actually navigate this site. Um, so that's demo.cat5.tv slash 002. Sorry, I've done all the talking, haven't I? No, no. But, uh, yeah, are you learning some stuff? Hardly noticed. Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> Oh, hi. <laughs> just, just over here. Hi. <laughs> well, you're following just along on the Mac, right? And I am, uh, yeah. So does that, uh, does that, you starting to see how those elements kind of fall into place? And yeah. 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 It's yeah. kind of yeah. neat. I do all like the Photoshop stuff and plug yeah. it all in, but it's nice to see how, uh, how it, it goes from, comes together when it yeah, from Photoshop to, uh, to web. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is Category 5 TV, and of course, uh, this, this is a part of our series on web development that uh, Krista and I have been putting together for you. Um, you can find out more and, uh, and watch uh, other episodes in the series at cat5.tv slash webdev, and you'll be able to, uh, to download uh, any of the files that you see here on the show as well uh, with regards to this. And we'll have some links uh, to the different applications that you can use as well. So thanks so much for watching tonight. It's been nice having you here. Great it's to have you guys here. Nice Eric, to be here. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're not. Well, we can't read that. You're under a bright light. Well, you can't read that. What is it? Oh, go Leafs go. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. <laughs> On that note, hey, have a great week. Uh, Hillary's there with us, too. Hey, Hill. Hi, guys. Thanks. Hope I'm you have a great here. week, Hillary. Thanks. And I'll see you guys next week. Yep. Take care. See everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.